reading this evening is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 24. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove, drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, it is good to have you here with us on this crazy, smoky evening. And uh, those of you that are joining us online, um, thank you for joining us. It's great to have you as well. So this week, we are continuing in our six-week sermon series, looking at the topic of faith and work, relating the work of our lives to our faith and life followers of Jesus Christ. The last week, the first week, we looked at Genesis chapter 1 and 2. We looked at the, the, the big story uh, in which uh, we as human beings, you know, in, the, in the persons of our uh, parents, Adam and Eve, find our identity and vocation as male and female created in God's image and likeness with this purpose of representing God as uh, in his image and likeness as well representing him within I should say his cosmos temple the creation itself that is the temple that God himself built and it put and installed us as his image in the creation with heaven as his throne and earth as his footstool. This is the story that Genesis is telling in which we find our place. And in that, we are given work. Work is given by God before sin, before the fall. It's really, it's a, it's a gift. It is what we are to work out in a priestly vocation. This is the, the, the Hebrew words that are given to Adam to work and to keep the garden uh, absolutely involved this, this, horror, this, this vertical dimension of a relationship with God himself in which all of the work that we do, first and foremost, is offering to him. All of our lives are meant, therefore, to be worshipped and to be offering. And we are seen, first and foremost, as priests in his creation temple. And on this earth, as we work this out, 
we are given the task of being co-rulers with God in that relationship with him. That's the context in which we order, we take dominion, we do our work in creation, bringing God's good order, bringing uh, meaning and blessing and wholeness and flourishing as we uh, live and move and function all in him. That's the picture that we're given in Genesis. It's ideal and it's perfect, dare I say. But this week, we're going to focus on Genesis chapter 3, as we just heard in the reading. And uh, we're going to look, therefore, at the effects of the fall and sin. <laughs> Fun topic, right? <laughs> as a result of the fall, everything is broken. This picture, this this priestly creation, temple, vocation, identity, and calling picture is broken as a result of our rebellion, as a result of our refusal to trust God. And I do want to say our rebellion and our refusal to trust God. It's not like we can just look back and say, well, Adam and Eve, they did this and they did that because the story of Adam and Eve is the story of you and I. And what they did then is what we are always doing now. And from Adam and Eve, that fundamental refusal to trust God and to rebelliously go our own way is what we are doing and have done. And, and in that context, our original um, calling, our original identity within his creation temple has been defaced and distorted. I, I would say to such a degree that we no longer, on our own, we no longer even recognize that that's who we are and who we're called to be. It's not destroyed, it's not undone, but it is so distorted and defaced that we don't recognize it apart from God speaking to us in revelation. God speaking to us, which is exactly what he is doing in Genesis, in the scriptures. So we need his help to see it, and we need his help to accept it. So means that today, you and I, we, as we come into this world, it's not a level playing field. It's not even neutral. It's, the positive has been wiped out, but we come into a context that really can best be described as conflict, war, battle, right? We have an enemy. We have an enemy. The serpent of Genesis 3, uh, the devil, Satan, uh, dark powers, demonic principalities, we have an enemy that continues to speak to us with the same deceiving, lying, tempting voice. And we today continue to listen to that voice, believe that voice, distrust God, and respond accordingly. Scripture talks about our enemies being the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that also means that we are an enemy. We don't just have an enemy. I mean, you could say the world is external to us. You could say the devil is external to us. But when Scripture says our enemy is the flesh, that means we are our own enemy. And we are not only our enemy, but we are God's enemy, right? The Apostle Paul talks about us, men and women, human beings, being by nature uh, hostile, hostile in our minds, alienated from God, enemies of God. And that, that is the deep 
default position of our hearts. And it's hard. It's hard to hear. It's hard to really, like, own, like, that's me. That's, that's me? That's... And I think sometimes we need to we need to stop and allow God to speak to us deeply so that we, we can own the degree to which we ourselves have been broken and distorted by this thing that we call the sin or the fall. So that's that's bad news. But part of the good news anyway, the beginning of the good news is that nevertheless, despite that, we are not um, we are not rejected by God. We are not cast off by Him. We are not put in a completely hopeless position. In, in reality, we continue, and He gives us the dignity of continuing to bear His image on this earth and represent Him. <laughs> we don't do a good job of it, but we continue to be His image bearers in His temple cosmos, the creation temple. We continue, and we continue to actually be loved by the God that we distrust and refuse to follow. He has not abandoned us. He has not abandoned us. And our, our original creational calling, our vocation in Him remains intact. Uh, and that's good news. So, let's unpack for a couple minutes just the implications of work, for work in this context. Okay. And, and notice in the text that was read, the text that, that you heard, which is often called uh, the pronouncement of the curse, uh, after the sin of the tree, well, the serpent is cursed, right? The serpent is cursed. And then, who else is cursed? No one. The ground is cursed. The serpent is cursed. The ground is cursed. But the man and the woman are actually not cursed. I think that's just important to observe. I believe it would be accurate to say that God's words to the woman and then to the man are more God pronouncing the consequences of what's happened. This is, this is some of the consequences. This is just what it's going to look like. Life is going to look like this. And the core of that pronouncement is that now the powers of death are inextricably embedded, interwoven into all aspects of of life. Everything is affected now by the powers of death at work in us and through us. And God speaks to the man and the woman about pain. As a result of that, life is going to be painful. And he speaks to the woman in the whole area of, of bearing children. A uniquely female role and speaks about the uh, fertility or maybe infertility, fruitfulness or lack of fruitfulness of her own body in bearing children or not bearing children or all of the, the reality of the potential for death in the very conception of life pain that I think that God speaks of is not simply physical pain. It is very much emotional, spiritual, it's, it's mental, it's as anguish, um, as well as the potential for physical pain, right? Um, with, with the man, it's 
the fertility of the ground and the fruitfulness or lack of fertility and lack of fruitfulness of the ground. And that, of course, is an image, a symbol, a metaphor for work, uh, for producing, and for therefore being able to live. And, and whereas the words to the woman are very uniquely the woman's role, the words to the man are universal. Right? They apply to men and women because they have, because both men and women engage in work and we are going to experience well frustration. We're going to experience uh, it's like the ground itself won't respond to our attempts to order. Our work is to bring order but but it won't respond. It's like it itself rebels. So our experience universally is frustration. I'm going to, I'm just going to briefly mention two things. Frustration and idolatry around work. Both of which have consequences. Okay? So in regard to our experience frustration in work. I mean, I don't think I have to go very deep into this, but the reality is that we all recognize that work is, it's, it's mixed. There are, there is work that we enjoy. There's work that we find uh, fulfilling and fruitful. There's work that we like, but there's a lot of work that we don't like and that we don't find fulfilling or joyful. There is, for all of us, uh, a never-ending, never-ending list of chores and repairs and tasks that simply must be done. Must be done. <laughs> and if we don't do them, the consequences are worse than doing the job we don't want to do. Like, like Emptying the cat litter box. Okay? I don't think anybody wants to or I would enjoy uh, emptying the cat litter box. So, proposed solution. Just don't do it. <laughs> and, and you will soon find that, that not doing it is far worse than doing it. And there's, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of work that fits that very category. There's so many times where we do that work of bringing order, and it seems like, actually it doesn't seem like, it's true, that the very minute that we finish bringing order is the same minute that disorder begins to set back in, right? Therein lies this frustration. It, you know, whether we're uh, dealing with laundry, or uh, cleaning up the kitchen, or uh, cleaning out the garage, or painting a church, <laughs> repairing a roof, uh, whatever it is, um, <laughs> uh, even our own bodies, right? Trying to get, bringing order to my hair. <laughs> as soon as I'm done bringing order, disorder sets in, right? And, and, and therein is, is embedded this, these powers of undoing, the powers that ultimately are the powers of death that are embedded to um, everything that we do. And that, that leads to a kind of incessant and often grinding nature to work, which is profoundly unpleasant. And I, I think using the word pain that Genesis uses is appropriate in this. It's appropriate. And I, I mean, I suspect we've all had moments that we can relate. Like, when I was in high school, I got a job one summer working on a foundation crew, putting in foundations for houses. And the guy who was slightly my superior, but not even our boss who ran the crew, one day told me, I want you to move this pile of heavy forms, foundation forms, from here to here. 
And I, I looked at him and I said, why? <laughs> and I challenged him. And I did not win that challenge. And he refused to tell me and it made no sense to me. And, and the, the fact that there could be any meaning in that work had to depend on him giving me a why. And I never got that why. <laughs> but I still had to do it. I also uh, had a job for through college, for four summers up in a cannery in Alaska. And I, I worked uh, helping to supply a line of machinery with the parts that were needed to produce hundreds and hundreds of cans, empty cans a minute to go down to machines to be filled with salmon. And I worked doing the same thing seven days a week 15 hours a day for the entire summer. And there was nothing, apart from some of the people I worked with and uh, uh, the money I made or went home with at the end of the summer because I couldn't spend it anyway. There was no reward, there was nothing fulfilling, there was no sense of, of genuine meaning in my job in doing that. And Genesis 3 uses these words, verse 19, and by the sweat of your face you shall be bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The result of sin and the fall and the powers of death being released mean that we will work with pain and frustration all the days of our life until we die. Which is not a very enticing picture, is it? But it is. It is a universal and inescapable experience. Frustration capped by death. And so, as a result of that, we as human beings a long history of seeking to escape. And in that escape, do we turn to trusting the one true living God? We do not. We turn to creative things. We, we create idols. We, we turn to creative things and demand from them that they will tell us who we are and provide for us what only God can truly provide. And this is true of work. And I just, I, I would encourage you to think about work and idolatry. How does that maybe play itself out in your life or your experience? What does that look like? I think actually we probably come up with lots and lots of different examples and answers. But one way or another, we often, we will look, or we're encouraged to look, to our career paths as being the thing that in life is going to meet our needs. Right? And... Uh, We sacrifice great amounts of time and energy, uh, uh, studying hard and working hard in school and uh, getting the right degree and the right preparation to get in the right school, to get the right job with the right boss and the right coworkers and the right commute and the right geography and the right company and the so that we can have the right house and drive the right car and we can and, and all of that is not necessarily bad in fact it's a it's a good thing i mean we as parents want our kids to learn to work hard and achieve goals and but i think we all might recognize that there's there's a propensity for our hearts to shift in the middle of that and for us to be pouring in to that career path. 
act in such a way that we demand that it fulfill our identity and provide status and honor and uh, um, title and, and wealth and um, control and power, um, security and comfort and ease. And we, look to, we look to that to be our savior. And often we can be willing to sacrifice everything else to gain that. Um, scripture has um, just one line in, a, in, in uh, the, pro the prophetic book of Habakkuk that speaks to this. I'll just read this. It says, therefore, he sacrifices to his net. Think of a fisherman and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. We look, we look to the end, and we will make sacrifices of relationships and family and others around us to get what we demand that our work should provide for the ways in which we seek escape. I think the flip side, the flip side of that idolatry is we can sometimes just try to opt out of that, but we make an idolatry of leisure and set up, I don't, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to work hard. I don't, I'm going to work the absolute minimum. I'm going to live for the weekend. When I can hang out with my buddies and crack a beer and go fishing and, and live the good life that's portrayed for us on you know, commercials on TV and um, you know just travel and leisure and fun and, 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 and happiness and that's where you're going. And, and that too uh, is again not a bad thing in and of itself, but it can become a kind of God thing where we again look to, to that in an idolatrous way to define who we are, to get what we can only get from God. And in the end, I mean, does it deliver the things that we want? Does it truly deliver? I think we would all answer no. You know, maybe for a short while, and at certain times it looks like it does, but ultimately it can't. It cannot. Deliver. And in that context, we end up being betrayed, becoming slaves. We become trapped in that. And any time that we take an idolatrous path in our hearts as human beings, we open the door for dark, demonic powers to come and enslave and torment. And so it's a lose-lose proposition if work and our attempts to escape from work are seemingly futile and we in the end cannot escape from death. Not very encouraging, is it? <laughs> himself and we and, and on his terms and we are barred from the garden we are excluded and sent out he's the one source and we're cut off so it's a 
they are sent out of the garden. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he is taken. There's your sentence. In pain and in frustration, work the ground and then die because you've lost access. Well, That's where we're going to end it this week, except for one final thought. Think about what is lost and what is not lost in this equation. What is lost is the sense of the presence of God walking in intimate, uninterrupted relationship in the cool of the day, as it's as the metaphor in the garden in his direct presence with that priestly identity and the, and the assurance of that goodness of that relationship, that is lost. That is lost. Access to the tree of life, that is lost. That is lost. But what is not lost is God's loving, pursuing presence. Sometimes I think we, have, we go too far in saying, uh, you know, sin separates us from God, and it's like we're, like there's this giant chasm, unreachable chasm between us and God because of sin. You know, that can only be bridged in the end by Jesus and the cross. And, and, and while that's partly true, you know, Augustine says that, that God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. And even in this lost and wandering state in which we don't know ourselves and we don't know God, what is not lost is God's gracious, loving, pursuing presence. And that is not only our hope, that's the story of the rest of Scripture. And so next week, we're going to continue by looking at um, God's redeeming presence. Amen. Stand together, and on page two of our liturgies, we'll say it together, we'll confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.